Hello and welcome. I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. For each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. This conversation is about the novel Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And I'm joined by our Novel Conversations readers, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey. Katie, Peter, welcome. Thank you, Frank. Hey, we're glad to be here. Thanks for that. Thanks for coming. Before we start our conversation, let me read just a brief introduction for our novel. Published by Ray Bradbury in 1952, Fahrenheit 451 is the story of Guy Montag, a fireman. But in the bleak dystopian future of this novel, firemen burn. They do not put out fires, they start fires by burning books and the houses in which they are hidden. The story of how those Montag knows and those he meets change his life make up the story of Fahrenheit 451. Before we start talking about this dystopian story, let me ask you both if you've read this before or if this is the first time you're reading it. Uh, Katie? Uh, I've read it before in middle school. Do you remember what you thought about it when you read it as a middle school student and how it's different for you now? Well, reading it now in the midst of a pandemic and as an adult and as a teacher, it makes it much more real or a lot closer than I would have thought when I was a 12-year-old. Maybe a little less fictional now, huh? Mm -hmm. Peter, how about you? Is this the first time you've read uh, Fahrenheit 451? Frank, it might be, but at my <laughs> at my age, I don't. I also may have read this earlier, but uh, I came to it as a first time reader. What's your first response to it? You know, I loved it first off, but as Katie said, in the midst of a pandemic, it had special like connotations. We're all stuck at home, and. Uh, they were in this book. That was the goal of the government, to keep everybody happy, to keep them at home, to keep them uh, occupied. And we're all trying to do that right now, but it's it's different. But we'll get into talking about that, I'm sure. I enjoyed it. Good, good. And you can be sure that we'll get into that discussion. But, you know, let's take a step back one moment, Katie, and tell me, what's the significance of the title Fahrenheit 451? Well, as the legend goes, Bradbury called his local fire department while he was writing this and asked... Hello, at what temperature does paper burn? And the fireman replied, Fahrenheit 451. And he said, I have a title. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know whether that's really an apocryphal author's uh, story. When you hear a good story, stick to it. Mm -hmm. Katie, we're also told he wears an orange salamander as a, as a badge, a logo badge. Can you tell me what the orange salamander is about? Yeah, so I think for us, it mainly serves as a symbol for the firemen that they can withstand fire and flame. Right, that's the story of a salamander. Right, and I think that we can take that further in general. The salamander was thought to show rebirth and immortality, kind of a survival in destruction. Very good, great, great. Thanks for filling us in on those. Uh, okay, Peter, do you now want to go ahead and tell me about Guy Montag? I would love to. He is a fireman, as you said. But uh, in a flip of what you and I know today as a fireman, these firemen's job was to burn books. We'll find out later that his captain actually refers to them as the custodians of the peace of mind. But when we meet him, he's at the fire station. He just got back from burning a bunch of books, and he leaves to walk home. On the walk, he meets a little girl. She's odd. She introduces herself as Clarice McClellan, and they walk, and they talk, and eventually he becomes irritated by her questions. She keeps probing him. She asks him about work. She asks him uh, how he feels about that. She names his feelings, and I think it leaves him uneasy, partly because there's an innocence about Clarice that we will find as we talk about Guy's relationship with his wife. Yeah, things are, are very different there. And I believe that that really sets Guy up in a sense of attuning his feelings and his emotions. It was an odd encounter. This is not something that's happened to Guy Montag before at night when he walks home from the fire station. Absolutely. And Katie, when he gets home, the night goes from odd to 
tragic. When he gets home late at night, he finds his wife has overdosed on sleeping pills. So he calls the emergency hospital and two strange men with strange machines come to his home and they pump her stomach. And for the two strange men with strange machines, this is certainly not a strange occurrence for them. They're going on these kinds of emergency runs, I don't know, a dozen times a night now. Yeah, that's true. And it's interesting because the first machine does indeed pump her stomach. The other guy is replacing her blood supply. It's, it's crazy, Frank. It's a quick insight into the state of society now where it's fairly routine for people to be overdosing on pills and needing emergency resuscitation, if you will, in the middle of the night. Absolutely. But Peter, the next morning... Oh, the next morning. They wake up. Guy comes out and she's making toast. Strange. Yeah. He, he addresses Mildred and she says, well, what? And he tells her that she overdosed last night. Oh, no, no, she says. I, she didn't remember a thing about it. She thinks that they had had a party and she was just feeling a little hungover. So he just goes nuts because she had overdosed on her sleeping pills. She denies it. He says, not in a billion years. So, Katie, now we know that the wife has some issues, but beyond the sleeping pills, can you describe what her daily life is like? Oh, sure. So when she wakes up, she first has to remove her earplugs, her ear thimbles. Um, actually, I think today we call them earbuds. Right. <laughs> so she takes them out. She sits down on the couch with her script. Now her script will tell her in front of the TV how to interact with the people. They give her lines that she can put in her own words to interact with the people on the TV. This is how they entertain themselves. They're obviously not reading books. Right, but then at other points, she has her family on the screen sitting in the parlor with her aunts and uncles. Peter, do you want to explain a little bit more about the script part? I do, because the aunts and the uncles, the family that Katie mentioned, that's all in quotation marks. These people are paid actors that are put up on the screen, and Mildred's got a script that reads her into that relationship. She has a role. She has lines that she has, as Katie said, that she has to provide. But the interesting thing about the technology is that Guy paid an additional $100 for the device that fills Mildred's name in to blanks that are left in the broadcast. So when the when the aunt says, well, when Mildred gets up and goes to the, it's, it's scary. Right. Let's be clear. It's almost a, a subscription service where they pay a fee and periodically Mildred gets sent these scripts that she can read along with whatever's going on on her three walls of TV screens. And it makes her part of the narrative. As you said, the characters on the screen will be talking. All of a sudden, they'll look to Mildred, and Mildred has to read her line off of her script. She believes, perhaps more than a little bit, that she's part of this show. That, as Katie said, that these people are her friends, her aunts, her cousins. And that this is her life. And that's the scary part of this. The government has brought this kind of technology into the homes to actually engage people so deeply that they have no time to think. Right. And instead of arguing over the remote control, they're arguing over, I want a fourth wall of TVs. Almost, but not quite similar to our experience today, perhaps, Peter. Well, I mean, we do see too many people diving down a six inch by nine inch tablet. Or phone. Or phone. Right? You don't need four walls to be captured for hours by what's in front of you. You're right. But this is so much more powerful. All right. Well, to continue our story, Peter, the next night he encounters Clarice again. And he learns a few things about her. He does. As he's walking, he discovers that she'll be 17 years old in a month. And she loves to taste the rain and pick dandelions and chase butterflies. As he goes uh, out on the sidewalk, he finds her walking towards him, face towards the sky and letting the raindrops fall on her tongue. They talk. She proposes the dandelion love test. Oh, I think you're going to have to remind me of that one. Oh, okay. She picks up what is the last dandelion of the season uh, out of the grass. And she says that th this will tell you whether you're in love or not. So she holds it underneath her chin. Do I have any yellow? Yes, he says. You have yellow underneath your chin. Oh, okay. Well, then, so let me try it on you. And she does. And he fails. And she calls it. She says, oh, you're not in love. Oh, of course I'm in love. I'm, I've got a wife and I got this. And I got you know. And he's all protesting, but he's also crushed inside. He knows that she called it. 
And Katie, what else do we learn about her at this time? Well, she's actually on her way to the psychiatrist. She goes there once a week. She sits down with the psychiatrist. She's sent there because nobody understands her. Society doesn't understand her because she thinks. More importantly, I think, than she thinks, she asks questions. Mm -hmm. Very much. She asks him why he's a fireman, why he's not like the rest of the firemen. Does he give her an answer? He doesn't answer, and they part ways. All right, Katie, now we get to a scene at the firehouse, and we're introduced to, I don't know if we want to call it a character, but it's the mechanical hound. Oh, I think it's definitely a character. So, Katie, tell me about that mechanical hound. So, in the fire station, there's a mechanical hound with eight legs and covered with metal and then small hairs on top and ruby eyes staring at Montag. A mechanical hound with eight legs? And they actually have to keep it in a cage. This isn't something like that you can flip the switch on. What's the purpose of this mechanical hound? The hound is given a scent and it sniffs out the scent and it can attack whoever smells on it. So essentially it has the skills of a real hound, only, if we will, superpowers? I think that's a good way to put it. Indeed, and it's a hunt-and-kill device. It's a weapon. And the hound scares Montag. Yeah. Montag goes to the chief. He says, Captain Beatty, something's wrong with the dog. Yeah, because the dog had snarled at Guy as he came into the firehouse that day. But the other firemen sitting at the card table just laugh at him and, Hey, what's the matter? You got something to hide? We'll find out. I guess we'll find out. Uh, But uh, Montag continues to be intrigued by Clarice as uh, she leaves flowers for him and pictures on his doorstep and walks him to the corner every day. Each day they continue to talk and to think and connect. But eventually Montag realizes he hasn't seen Clarice for four or five days. And Katie, the conversations with Clarice have caused Montag to start thinking. And even more troublesome for him He's also starting to ask questions. Right. And the fire station, the monotonous day after day, starts to wear on him. He begins to ask questions to his fellow firemen about the past. I'm sure this isn't going to end well, but I know you have a quote you want to read. Yes, I do. So he's asking Stone Man and Black, the other firemen, about the history of the firemen. And this is a quote from the book. Established, 1790, to burn English-influenced books in the colonies. The first firemen... Benjamin Franklin. And then there's a list of rules. Do you want to just read a couple of those rules? Sure. Answer the alarm quickly. Start the fire swiftly. Burn everything. Report back to the firehouse immediately and stand alert for other alarms. So Benjamin Franklin was the first fireman book burner? That's what they say. Hmm. But then suddenly the fire alarm goes off and we get to ride with Montag. I can't say to the fire. I guess I've got to say we ride with Montag To the burning? And then they burn. And in this particular instance, the woman who lives in the house burns with her books by her own choice. She actually lights the match herself. Despite Montag trying to save her. She figures, I don't know if I want to survive if my books don't survive. I think that was exactly what happened to her, and I think that affected Montag deeply. Oh, I'm sure it does. Uh, And Peter, tell me about Montag and After the Fire. Sure, because he goes back to his empty life and his empty wife. Now, Clarice had once asked him a question, and he and his wife start to try to remember when they first met, but neither of them could. So Montag goes to bed, and he slips a book that he stole under his pillow. But Katie, before Montag falls off to sleep, he remembers about not seeing Clarice, and he asks his wife about her. Right, and Mildred replies with the shocking news. She thinks Clarice is dead, got hit by a car, the whole family gone. Hmm. Just like that. And for Montag, he's shocked. It's perhaps not so shocking for Mildred, but this really has an effect on Montag. And in fact, when Montag wakes up the next morning, he's bothered and sick. And Mildred is stunned and confused because he's never been sick. Peter, is he really sick? Yes, I think he is sick, both physically and psychologically. I think he's sick from the kerosene, from the the smoke of the burning books, but also from the burning of the woman who self-immolated rather than live without the books that they'd come to destroy. And on top of that, the loss of this new friend, Clarice. So the, the husband and wife begin to fight over it. But Peter, their fight is interrupted by the doorbell. Uh, who's, at the, who's at the door? It sure is. It's Captain Beatty from the fire station. Because he stops in, again, like Mildred. He's never known Guy to be sick. He's coming to check up. 
but he just kind of settles in, sits in the house, and he tells Montag that every fireman hits this wall and, and wants to know more about the past and, and begins to have questions about the books and their job and, and just to question everything. But Katie, Chief Beatty has so much more to say. Right. So he tells Montag all about the times of the past and how it began and how it came to be that intellect plus books equals misery. And here's a quote. It didn't come from the government down. There was no dictum, no declaration, no censorship to start with. No. Technology, mass exploitation, and minority pressure carried the trick. Thank God. Today, thanks to them, you can stay happy all the time. You are allowed to read comics, the good old confessions, or trade journals. Sure, and that's because, you know, nobody wanted to offend anybody. Sure, and why? Well, quoting Beatty again, now let's take up the minorities in our civilization, shall we? Bigger the population, the more minorities. Don't step on the toes of the dog lovers, the cat lovers, the doctors, the lawyers, the merchants, the chiefs, the Mormons, the Baptists, the Unitarians, the second generation Chinese, the Swedes, the Italians, the Germans, the Texans, the Brooklynites, the Irishmen, the people from Oregon or Mexico, end of quote. So what they had done is try to sanitize everything. And in fact, I think Ray Bradbury is speaking directly to Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook when he tells him, the bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. Oh, <laughs> right on, Frank. But Peter, how do we get from the society that Katie described to a place where firemen burn books? Great question. In this society, Beatty continues in his meeting, a book is a loaded gun in the house next door. Burn it. Take the shot from the weapon. Close quote. I mean, it's, it's a terrible place to be. The books are the danger that the firemen are protecting the citizens from. That's it, exactly. This is where I found that quote I gave you earlier. We are custodians of our peace of mind. So, Katie, while the preacher is preaching his sermon, what's Montag thinking? And where's Mildred? Well, Montag is thinking this is all leading up to the moment where Beatty is going to ask him for that book he took last night. That's what I was thinking. Meanwhile, Mildred is fluffing his pillow and getting really close to revealing the book, trying to quickly clean up the apartment, fluffing his pillow, watching her TV at the same time. So Montag is being assaulted by all these emotions and feelings. He's afraid of what the chief is going to do if he finds this book underneath his pillow. He's afraid of what Mildred's going to do. He's still worrying about Clarice. He's questioning everything, his job, his marriage, simply everything. He is sick. He doesn't feel well. He's really having a rough morning. But Katie, Peter, doesn't stop there. This is where things really start to spiral out of control for Montag. And we'll pick back up on just how crazy things get for Montag right after this break. You're listening to Novel Conversations. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and today I'm having a conversation about the novel Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And I'm joined in my conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey. All right, Peter, before we took our break, we're going to talk about how this crazy morning gets even crazier. Sure. After Betty left, Montag exploded out of bed and he had a meltdown. He raced over to a vent and he pulled out all of the books that he had hidden for years. There's more books? Yeah, there's more. And Mildred is just mortified. So they, they fought about it and she was in a panic. But Montag comes to the conclusion in order to shake the feeling of anxiousness and this riddled mystery behind the unknown of the books, he figures he must read them and read them together with his wife. So they did. Katie, can you imagine how Montag and Mildred must feel? They're reading books, something they've never done before. They're trying to understand what they're actually reading. Montag hopes he's learning something. But can you imagine the impact that this would have had on people that have never looked at a book before? I have been reading books my whole life. Montag has never read a book, has never cracked one open and started at the beginning and gotten all the way through. Never smelled one. He's now trying to take that all in at once by flipping through these books that he's stored up for the past year. He's trying his hardest to understand. He's reading everything he can as fast as he can. He wants to understand it, but he can't. He's struggling. He doesn't know what these books mean, and that's making him more and more frustrated. It's especially frustrating because Mildred is standing there looking at him and cares only for her parlor family. She can't wait to put the book down and get back to her TVs. You got that right. 
Meanwhile, Ray Bradbury drops in a few lines, and this is what he says to us. Bomber jets fly overhead. War is near. We actually haven't heard anything about this war yet. And then he also tells us the mechanical dog circles their home. Peter, it's at this point that Montag remembers an interaction he had with a professor in the park many years ago. Ah, uh, yes. He remembers the man, Mr. Faber, was angry at his loss of books. And Montag still has Faber's phone number, so he rings him up. Maybe Faber can explain what all these books mean and why they're so important. Does he actually call him? He does. And it does not go well. So Montag decides he's just going to go visit the man and get face-to-face with him. I can imagine how Mr. Faber would feel getting a phone call from a, a fireman. You're right. After all, Montag is one of the bad guys. But Montag decides to go visit the professor. Faber opens the door and greets Montag with great apprehension. But they have a lengthy discussion over Montag's plight with the books, which Faber understands. And eventually they decide to create a plan. Katie, a plan for what? So Mr. Faber has an old friend with a printing press, and they plan to take the books that Montag has collected and reprint them and hide them in the houses of other firemen to get them in trouble. But Montag needs to overcome Beatty in his position at the fire station, but he does not have the guts to do this. He's too afraid. He doesn't know how it's going to go. Mr. Faber has an idea that he's created this seashell. One of these earbuds. Right, but these ones work as walkie-talkies almost. Ah. So he can put it in his ear and Faber can hear him and he can talk back to Montag and tell him how to confront Beatty in the right way. Sort of a technological Cyrano for... Right, exactly. lack of a better phrase. But Peter, first Montag has to go home. Yes, and he has to deal with Mildred as she entertains her friends, Mrs. Phelps and Mrs. Bowles. But he doesn't deal with them well at all. So he gets so frustrated at their ignorant ramblings that he takes out a book and he starts to read it to them. Now, Mildred, understandably, is mortified. Mrs. Phelps sobs and cries. Mrs. Bowles gets angry and storms out never to return again. And Montag has almost spoiled the plan. And this is all while Faber is screaming in his ear to stop. But Montag just couldn't help himself. He's really in a spiral here, isn't he? But Katie, he does eventually make it to the fire station, doesn't he? Right. And on his way to the fire station, Montag trembles at the thought of having to confront Beatty. But when he walks in, he hands Beatty the book and says, Okay, I'm done reading it. You can burn it now. Beatty pokes deeply at Montag's plight and welcomes him back to the burning cult with great antagonistic and demoralizing banter. But then the fire signal breaks the tension. Right. And they all have to jump up and head out on their orange salamander. And Montag is shocked to find out that they're arriving at his house. Peter, his home? So so Beatty just wailed at Montag, screeching his, I told you so. You should not have read those books. Look at what you've done. He does the whole speech over again at Montag. And while he's berating Montag, he's throwing in quotes from Shakespeare and Alexander Pope. He's quoting Macbeth and referencing Shakespeare, and he says, Sweet food of sweetly uttered knowledge, Sir Philip Sidney. Words are like leaves, and where they most abound, much fruit of sense beneath is rarely found. Alexander Pope. He's adding insult to injury as he does this. And Peter, what is Mildred doing as the orange salamander arrives at their house to burn it down? Well, Mildred runs out of the house with her suitcase, gets into her car and drives off without any interaction with Montag, just muttering words like a crazy lady. Mildred had unearthed all the books that Montag had hidden in the garden after the interaction with the two women. All of his books? And they are now piled up in the house. Katie, uh, time for a fire? Yep. Beatty orders Montag to do the dirty work himself and light his own house on fire with the flamethrower. Montag does as he's told, even as Faber is begging him to run in his little earpiece. Montag knows that the hound is nearby and he would not escape without his life lost. So soon his house burned into rubble and ash. Peter, I've got to ask, who turned Montag in? It wasn't Mildred, was it? Well, it was Mrs. Phelps and Mrs. Bowles who sounded the alarm first. But Beatty let that slide. 
still giving Montag a chance. But when Mildred sounded the alarm, Beatty knew it was time to finish this. His own wife turned him in. Yeah. And Katie, it continues to get even worse for Montag. Beatty struck Montag hard in the face, and his secret seashell went flying in the air. When Beatty picked it up, he realized there was someone on the other end. Beatty threatens Montag that their next stop will be Faber's house. And this is where Montag finally completely loses it. He points the flamethrower at Beatty, and he lights him up. He dies. Do you have a quote? Yeah, here's the quote. Beatty flopped over and over and over, and at last twisted in on himself like a charred wax doll and lay silent. Whoa. Well, that takes care of Beatty, but what about the hound? Yeah, the hound pounces on Montag. Yeah, Katie, I've got a great quote here. It made a single last leap into the air, coming down on Montag from a good three feet over his head, its spidered legs reaching, the procaine needle snapping out its single angry tooth. Montag caught it with a bloom of flame, a single wondrous blossom that curled in petals of yellow and blue and orange about the metal dog, clad it in a new covering as it slammed into Montag and threw him ten feet back against the bowl of a tree, taking the flame gun with him. This is one of those examples of Bradbury's writing that just, I loved. So the hound has injected Montag's leg with the needle. There's poison in it, so his leg goes limp. But fortunately for Montag, he's still got the flamethrower and he lights up the hound as well, essentially killing the mechanical hound. But he's not in the clear. He hears even more sirens roaring towards the house. Montag can't run. His leg is still limp. He's thinking, well, I'm done for. Peter, how does he get himself out of this one? So Montag grabs the last four books that he can find, and he attempts to run with his poison leg dragon behind him. But he's fumbling and falling. And meanwhile, those sirens get closer. So after a painful scream from the needles in his leg, the pain subsides some, and his fumbling turns to a slow jog as he somehow makes his way to Faber's. A siren races towards Montag as he walks, and and then a car picks up speed, racing towards him, and he begins to panic as he's sure that it's the police coming to arrest him, and his doom is nigh. The car gets closer and closer, and he begins actually to run, but he falls, and he knows it's over. But the car dodges out of the way of his body, and it speeds past him. It's a car full of reckless children. And in the middle of this panic, in the middle of his escape, Montag's thoughts go to, I wonder if these are the ignorant kids that killed Clarice. Well, Peter, does Montag ever get to Faber's house? Well, before he makes it there, Montag makes a stop at Mrs. Black's house. This was the fellow fireman we heard about earlier. And Montag plants the books there and says, all right, this is for all the times your husband planted books at people's homes and burned them down. It's your turn now, Mrs. Black. Well, Katie, he does finally make it to Faber's, and they agree to go their separate ways. But like some of the movies we've seen lately, they're even watching the chase coming at them. Right. Faber turns on his very small TV screen, where Montag, the fugitive, is prominently displayed. They release a new mechanical hound. So Montag and Faber drink some whiskey and depart ways. Peter, continued the escape story. Montag ran and ran and ran, and looking at times inside the houses at those parlor TV screens and continuation of the news feed that he and Faber had watched, he saw that the hound had made it to Faber's house, and his breath stopped. But the sprinklers roared in Faber's yard, hopefully concealing his scent. Then the dog kept on. Katie, he made it. Thank goodness. Well, he made it to the river. He was 300 yards down the river when the hound made it to the river, too. But he tossed and he turned and he fought through the tumultuous river water with the salt and the mud destroying his senses. His mouth is burning. His nose is burning. He's retching. He's screaming. Too much water. But he did. He made it to new land. And the hound has lost a scent. Right. And he found the train tracks and he followed them. Peter, what does he find at the end of the tracks? Well, he had a reaction to the tracks first. He had a sense. He had a sense of scent and a sense that Clarice had actually walked this way at one time in the past. It was an interesting connection, I thought, to his past. But then he saw a flickering fire, 
and, and he felt danger there. I can understand why. Sure, because he wasn't sure whether it was uh, from firemen or it was this war that he had uh, heard had broken out. But it turned out to be just a small gathering of men using the fire to warm themselves, which was absolutely 180 degrees from his experience of fire in the past, which was to burn things. But still, he hid in the bush for a while, and he watched, and he listened. And then finally he heard a man say, you can come out now. You are welcome here. Well, Montag revealed himself, and the man who spoke introduced himself as Granger and offered Montag some coffee. Katie, who are these men, these people? These men are outliers. They they know who Montag is. They've been watching him on their battery TV. They all have a little TV that they can watch, similar to our tablets, I might say. Mm-hmm. Hmm. They tell Montag that he lost the helicopters when he got to the river, and they watch on the TV together as the hound captures Montag, this dummy person who they've killed claiming him to be the real Montag, while Montag sits there with his new friends and watches it. And Granger says if they couldn't admit that they lost you, they had to close the story. So Granger, after that, introduces Montag to the rest of these bums who are professors, authors, and teachers. Each one of them has memorized books and can recite them. Granger tells Montag of the thousands of bums who walk the tracks and live to themselves— They have burned their books so as not to cause any trouble. They were not above the rest, but they could simply not live in the world of lies in the parlor families. They headed down the river to find another resting place now with some other fugitive friends. But Katie, this war that we've been hearing about soon comes close to home. A bomb lands on the city. Right. As they're walking through, they can see it just level the city in front of them. Montag's thoughts go to his wife. She's probably dead. But he's not entirely sad. He's sad for her, but he's not sad for himself. So the men move on and they walk ahead, remembering the past mistakes of man and how to mend it and how to make it better the next time around. And essentially, Peter, Katie, that's how the novel ends. Unresolved, but certainly perhaps with some hope. Yes, I think so. I was struck by the men he met around the fire. There's a quotation, bums on the outside, libraries inside. Men had clung to the ideas that were in these books, and they'd clung to the process of, you know, committing ideas to, well, to paper in that case, but now to their memories so that they can continue to be passed on. Katie, how about you? Unresolved, but some hope maybe? No, I think it does leave us with some hope. Granger has introduced each of these bums as a book or as an author. Each one of them is carrying that inside of them. And even in the last lines of the book, Montag realizes that he can be one of these two. He has tapped into the the books that he read. He can remember the lines and repeat them for the men he's with. And I think our hope relies on that. Agreed. And I hope you're right. (laughs) All right, so let's move into our last segment. And what I'd like from both of you now is some of your favorite moments or a passage from the book or maybe a character we didn't have a chance to talk about. Peter, do you have something for us? I have several, Frank. As I said before, I love this book. It's rather nicely laid out, I thought. Captain Beatty's formula for happiness. Quote, what do we want in this country? Above all, people want to be happy. Isn't that right? Haven't you heard it all your life? I want to be happy, people say. Well, aren't they? Don't we keep them moving? Don't we give them fun? That's all we live for, isn't it? For pleasure, for titillation. And you must admit, our culture provides plenty of these. Close quote. They fill people up. Beatty continues very shortly thereafter when he's talking about removing negative stuff from people's minds, quote, funerals are unhappy and pagan? Eliminate them too. Five minutes after a person is dead, he's on his way to the big flu, the incinerators serviced by helicopters all over the country. Ten minutes after death, a man's a speck of black dust. Let's not quibble over individuals with memoriams. Forget them. Burn all. 
burn everything. Fire is bright and fire is clean. Close quotation. Those are some really good quotes, Peter. Thank you for bringing those to us. Katie, do you have something for us? Yeah, I do. I like how in the book, we never have just a blank explanation of this dystopia, how it came to be or where it is, but we get it from different characters along the way, piece by piece. I think this part that we get from Faber is really descriptive and tells us more about how how this book is going to end, where it's going to go. But he tells us, he's telling Montag when they're first meeting, it's not books you need. It's some of the things that once were in books. The same thing could be in your parlor families today. The same infinite detail and awareness could be projected through the radios and the televisors, but are not. No, no, it's not books at all you're looking for. Take it where you can find it, in old phonograph records, old motion pictures, in old friends. Look for it in nature and look for it in yourself. End quote. So he's pointing out that it's not the books that are the bad thing. It's everything. But they've just watered down life so that it's not significant. That's a great one. One of my favorites as well. Uh, Perhaps my favorite passage is when Granger's introducing Montag to some of the men and describing some of the books that these men have memorized. And Granger makes the point, these men are now the books. And I, I have the quote here. Would you like someday, Montag, to read Plato's Republic? Montag says, of course. I'm Plato's Republic. Like to read Marcus Aurelius? Mr. Simmons is Marcus. How do you do, said Mr. Simmons. Hello, said Mr. Montag. I want you to meet Jonathan Swift, the author of that evil political book, Gulliver's Travels. And this other fellow is Charles Darwin. And this one is Schopenhauer. And this one is Einstein. And this one at my elbow is Mr. Albert Schweitzer, a very kind philosopher indeed. End quote. So I think Bradbury is making the point through Granger that it's not the form that matters. It's the information. It's the content. These men have the content. These men are now the books. It reminds me of the discussion we're having today in our society. When books can be read on phones, Kindles, iPads, and computers, what is a book? And Bradbury's answer, as I said, is a book is the content. It's not the form. And I think that's where we'll end our conversation today about the novel Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. I want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey. Katie, Peter, thanks so much. Thanks for having us, Frank. Thanks, Frank. I love this book discussion. You are welcome, and I agree with you. It was a pleasure. Thanks again, Katie and Peter. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of Evergreen Podcasts. For more information about upcoming Novel Conversations, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app, or go to our website at evergreenpodcast.com. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. Novel Conversations is produced by Julie Fink, and our audio engineer is Sean Rule Hoffman. A special thanks to our executive producer, Joan Andrews, and I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a Novel Conversation. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.